Hello and welcome. It's Deborah here from ThreadsCatchingInAction.com and I'm bringing you today another episode in the Stitching Together Online series, which is designed to keep your creative minds ticking over during this period of isolation. Um, last night in Australia, or in parts of Australia, we turned off our daylight saving. So with that, we got an extra hour of sleep, which was nice. And also, it seems by looking out the window that winter has arrived all of a sudden. I know a lot of you will be heading into spring and warmer weather, but we are going the opposite direction in the Southern Hemisphere. But never mind, I'm dressed for it with my, my warm pullover on. So today I want to talk about texture. Quite a few people have asked me about adding texture to your work, and there are so many ways you can do that. But we're going to start with a few relatively simple ways you can you can begin adding in texture to everything you make, regardless of whether it's something that you will turn into a bag or a quilt or just an abstract piece of art. So we're going to look at the way texture works. Now this is just a little little piece I made as an experiment and it was based on an image of lichen. And what I've actually done here is layer. So I don't know if you can see that I've actually got different stages or it's like um, steps of fabric there. And it's then been very heavily stitched with the free motion zigzag stitch. And you might, if I can get the light to catch it, you can see that it glitters a bit. So in this one, I have actually used some metallic thread to give it that sort of bit of glitter, which is really nice. That's not the main one I'm going to talk about, but it will give you an idea when you see the other things I've got lined up for you, hey, you can do something like this. So just take a, a picture of lichen or anything that you know you like the colours of and turn it into an abstract piece of art. So the next one I'm going to look at today is how you can create fabric of, of your own. Now I've done this one. This one was, it was a piece I actually found lying around that I'd never finished and it's still not finished, but I did a bit more on it yesterday to uh, show you how I go about creating this texture. And it becomes quite a firm fabric that you could actually use for a shoulder bag or um, even some type of upholstery fabric if you wanted to. It would make a great bolster or cushion or something like that. Um, and I'm going to show you a few of the steps that I made to start getting this texture and, and sort of colour wash design on there. It's uh, by no means finished, this one, but that deliberately so for the today's purposes. And the sort of thing you can make from something like that is, as I said, a bag. Or ages ago, I made this needle case using the same technique. Um, and it's what I call a sort of strippy technique, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes. But all I've done here is create, stitch the fabric. It's quite, quite stiff, as you can see. And then I've lined it with just cotton fabric. And then I've put some pieces of felt inside, stitched them down the middle. And you then have a needle case. You can make them any shape, size, whatever you want. I just, I made this piece of fabric and then I didn't know what to do with it. So I thought, oh, well, a needle case would be handy because I didn't have one or I only had a very old one. So I made this and it's, it's been great. And it folds over. The needles don't come through and poke you in the finger. So we'll have a look at that in a moment and how to make that fabric. Then I'm going to show you how you can create your own fabric again for making anything. Now you could make backgrounds for quilts. You can see this, it doesn't have any 3D texture or nothing huge, um, but it creates a really nice effect. If you either folded this over and made it into something, it would actually look really lovely just as a piece of abstract type fabric. But you can see I've done a a series of, of leaves on here and being Australian I tend to naturally err towards the eucalyptus shaped leaf and also they're really easy which is what I like um, and I'll show you how I made this I, I made this one deliberately quite thick you don't need to do that um, if you want something more translucent but I'll show you exactly how I put that together and then again a long time ago I used a similar leaf design 
and made the piece of fabric and then I turned it into this very handy pencil case. So these are things you could make as gifts for people. You could make a pencil case or you could make the needle cover or a shoulder bag or I once made one similar to this one and turned it into an evening bag for a friend and it, it looked fabulous. So this, I just found a pattern for a zippered lined needle uh, pencil case and did that and made it and it's been great. I use it all the time. It's fabulous for taking to classes and things like that. This one, I've actually added in some more materials. I'll show you in a moment how I create all the layers and then the stitching. But in this one, you can see it's got all these little other little bits and pieces. And you can add in whatever mixed media you like. I think this one had some pieces of um, merino wool, which is used for felting. These little lighter strips are just strips of a type of crochet ribbon. Um, so you can really scatter anything you like over the fabric. And then this one I've actually covered with tulle because I wanted it to be really firm and not, not um, fray at all while I was using it. But you, there are other options to using tulle. Um, but with the amount of stitching on it, the tulle doesn't really show anyway. Then finally, I will go on to how to add texture into your quilts. Now this one, it's just a, a very standard um, applique quilt. It's using the, the same design that I have in my book on uh, art quilts inspired by stained glass. If you look up on Amazon, you can find that book. Um, and that shows exactly how I make this type of design of applique quilt. Um, but on this one, I've also created quite a puffy center to this sunflower. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more later about how I actually did that. I don't have any video of that, unfortunately, because I made it years ago. This little quilt, it's a giant Russian sunflower that I actually grew in my garden many years ago. And this particular quilt was featured, oh gosh, ages ago in the Quilting Arts magazine, the US magazine that everybody knows about, I'm sure. And it was just one of their monthly challenges they had. And I entered this and had to send this little quilt winging its way across the world. And eventually I got it back again. So I've always loved it. I made several incarnations of it until I came up with this one. Um, but this particular design I have used so many times. It was just one of those photos of a sunflower that turned out really nicely. Um, so we'll talk about that and then we will talk a bit more about adding texture. Now in this quilt, this is Japanese, oops, Japanese windflowers. Um, and what I've done in the middle here is create a lot of dense stitching to give the piece some depth and form and, and different types of stitching to give it texture. Because with textured pieces, you want to reach out and touch them. Now, I know you're not meant to, but this is mine, so I can touch it. Um, but you want people to actually want to reach out and touch your work, because even if it's not got a 3D form, you're going to entice interest by making people want to look closer and, and think, oh, how, what does that feel like? So I am just going to, what will I do now? I'll go over to some little videos I've made yesterday of the first two pieces I showed you and talk you through those. And then we will come back and talk about these two art quilts and how, how I did those. So I will just switch over to my other video recordings. Just one moment. Okay, so let's begin by looking at the little piece that I used to or similar to what I used to make the needle case. Now you can see this is very heavily stitched at, at the bottom, but even then it's not probably quite finished. The base of this is actually a piece of quite firm stabilizer. And then I've put, just laid free cut strips of organza over the top and I've created a sort of seaside scene. And then just basically stitched each one down to keep in place. If I remember rightly, I think I actually fused these strips down. Uh, you, you could use either a paper-backed fusible web, like Blizer Fix or Wonder Under, or Misty Fuse, which I think is actually what I used in this case. Um, in that way, you will prevent the layers from moving without having to put anything like a sheet of organza or a sheet of tulle over the top. So once the base was all set up, I then started to stitch. Now I'm just beginning this little bit up the top here. 
because that hasn't had any previous stitching. And all I'm doing here is a rather random free motion zigzag stitch. I think I've got the stitch settings at about 2 or 2.5, um, but because you're doing free motion, it doesn't really matter that much what you choose. It more depends on how fast you move the fabric. But you can see that I'm moving it around in very random directions. And that helps to build up and fill that area. And I'm still working with the same yellow colour here, but eventually you'll see how it begins to blend and you create that colour wash effect when you either stitch over another colour or add in another coloured thread. Now at this point I'm putting in a little bit of detail with some darker blue thread and although it looks as though I might be using a straight stitch, I still actually am using a zigzag stitch, but simply moving sideways. And it's creating that sort of wiggly line that I want because I don't want any straight lines in this piece. Now you may be wondering how I create the little bursts of free motion satin stitch um, and I use a special setting on my machine. Now keep in mind that not every machine will have this setting but you can create a similar effect simply by using free motion zigzag stitch. Now looking at the control panel on my machine you can see I can actually turn off or on the width control. So I've turned it on which means I now have control over it. And I use this little slider up on the machine to vary the width. You can see where I just changed it. It's gone up to 5.5 millimeters now. And if you watch that, it will go up as I turn it to the right, slide it to the right, and then down again as I slide it to the left. And it'll go right down to zero, I think. Yes, there you go. So zero will mean basically you're stitching in one spot. The normal is about that. Yes, there we go, four. And then I can turn it off again if I want to. But we're going to leave it on for now and have a look at how I do this. So you need to move quite slowly and you do, it does require being a little bit ambi ambidextrous, which I'll show you more closely in a moment. So all I'm doing as I create these is I'm moving that little slider wider and then narrower and wider and narrower in order to create these little bursts of free motion satin stitch. It's a really useful technique for building up texture on a piece, particularly in something that's slightly abstract like this piece. Okay, so let's just look at a little bit more of this as I actually do it so that you can see the action. I'm moving very slowly. This is actual speed of stitching because you are in total control of the satin stitch. Working this way allows you to add either fine lines or heavy lines and you can stitch over previous lines and blend the colours more. Um, it's, it's just such a fabulous thing to do, particularly for abstract work. So at this point now I've moved down to a section that is already partially done and I'm adding in some of the gold colour. Now I'm not using the satin stitch technique here, I'm just using regular zigzag stitch, free motion zigzag stitch and start to build up the colours. And this is really useful if you're learning how colours blend with each other because the more you do it, the more you'll learn how colours mix with each other and what looks good over the top. And don't make the mistake of thinking you always need to put the dark colour on the bottom, um, particularly with this sort of thing. I think sometimes it's really lovely to have that light colour shining through from underneath the dark. Now you really can go on and on and on adding as much texture as you like with this type of thing. I'm still not happy even with this bottom section of this one, so I would go back sometime in the next few days hopefully and finish it and then I'd be able to use it for something. So there you go and it's it's gradually getting there. It's it needs a lot more on it yet, but and it needs more color, but without anything that's too startling. Don't ever put any any color in that's going to stand out too much and take away from the overall effect. Now moving on now to making your own sort of strippy fabric. I've used a piece of quite light stabilizer and some batting, neither of which you actually need. You could just use a piece of cotton on the back. I've even done this using sufficient layers of uh, sheer fabrics so that you end up effectively with uh, a two-sided fabric, which is very useful sometimes. What we'll then be doing is adding a couple of layers of sheer fabrics. I'm using organzas and you can mix and match the colours to 
get the effect you want. But before we do that, before we actually put those on, we need to make the strippy backgrounds. Now on the other pieces I've shown you, I've literally just cut strips and laid them across the fabric and added in other mixed media if I'd wanted to. This one, I want to carry on the leaf effect. So I'm cutting some leaves from some organza, which is a different color that you may notice. The top sheets I'm going to use are more mauves. These blues and the mauves look very nice together. Those couple of little spools of fabric, a uh, cotton thread, are what I'm going to use to stitch this. So then when all the leaves are cut, we arrange them in whatever pattern you like onto the background. So I've zipped this along a little bit so that you don't get bored watching me put out all these little leaves onto the fabric. Then we add on the two sheets of organza or more if you want to and pin it all together very securely. I begin pinning in the middle and work outwards to smooth out any bubbles as I go along the way. The thread used on the top is those two little spools of 30 gauge cotton thread in variegated colours. And then for the bobbin I've chosen a sympathetic colour. Now this is 40 gauge. Um, having a finer thread in the bobbin is not usually a problem, but if you need to alter your tension at all, then test a little piece first. The stitching process is again very simple. Begin in the middle to avoid any bubbles or puckering and all I'm doing is doing a large very simple leaf shape so I'm doing the outline and then I stitch down the center vein and I'll go back up that again you don't need to worry about being too particular with this unless you want it really precise And then as a bit of decoration, I'm sort of doing these just wavy lines down the side. Now, depending on how large the leaf is, there might be three, perhaps four or five, if it's a really large leaf of these lines. Most of these pieces in this, uh, these leaves have three, I think. Once I've finished putting the decoration in the center of the leaf, I then stitch around the edge and do these sort of tiny little circles of stitch just to create like almost like little French knots, except they're not handmade, they're done on the machine. Let me see if I can get in a bit closer to show you this one. Ah, here we go. You should be able to see this a little more clearly now. So there's little circles, then I stitch along to the next one. You can put them wherever you like, as many or as few as you like. Until you get to the end of the leaf. And then you'll just start another leaf and do the whole process all over again.
And so this is what it looks like about midway through. And I think at this point I changed colour. Now there wasn't a huge difference in these two coloured threads, but it was all I had that was the appropriate thing. So I'm using the slightly darker thread now, and you can see I'm beginning to overlap the leaves too. I like the effect of overlapping the leaves, but you don't have to if you don't want to. And you can see the effect on the back now. If you also consider that I hadn't used any backing fabric, I'd just used several layers of organza both sides, you would have had two-sided fabric. Now let's go back and have a look at the two art quilts that I wanted to talk about in, uh, in front of my computer. Just one moment. Okay, so here I am again. So we're going to take a look at the sunflower quilt and I'll talk a little bit about how I built up this texture on the, the center, the seed area of the sunflower. Because the rest of it is quite flat. It's just ordinary applique that's been stitched. What I did here was initially just put one big piece of dark brown fabric on there. But underneath that, I put an extra layer of batting, creating a, a sort of trapunto effect, I guess, a sort of cheating trapunto. But it's meant that once I'd stitched this center area down really, really firmly, the rest of it puffs out a bit. And it, it gives a really nice effect because if you look at a sunflower, the seeds sort of, they come out in a lovely rounded effect in front of you. Then this area, it was all a bit painful really because I cut many, many, many little tiny circles of fabric, cut them all freehand and arranged them all over. You can see I've used different colors of browns and it took me forever to do that, even though this is such a tiny quilt because I wasn't sure quite the effect I wanted. So I experimented for a while. And then I did lay a, a piece of tulle over the top, black tulle I think I used, um, in order to keep them all in place because otherwise one puff of wind and they'd have gone everywhere, which would have been horrible. Um, so then I did a whole lot of pebble stitching all over this area around here. Now pebble stitching is, is very simple free motion technique. A lot of people have trouble getting it circular, but to be honest on this, if there's the odd little angle in there, who's going to see it? Seriously. Um, I'm not the quilt police and I'm not going to look at things that closely. I'm, I'm after effect and natural looks rather than perfection in what I do. So some people don't like that, but that's the way I operate. So I did pebble stitch all over, which sort of emulates what I'd done with the little circles of fabric. And then again, just like I did on that piece that I just showed you with the little sort of machine done French knots, I did the same thing with some bright yellow here to create these, these yellow dots. So the concept is simple. It was a little bit time consuming, but there actually isn't anything very complex in there. And this center area, all I've done is, I'll have a look at the back. I don't know if you can see the back there. It's really just a, quite a small meander stitch, almost like a stipple that I've done that because I wanted to really flatten that down so that the surrounding area puffed out with that extra layer of batting in there. So that's how that one was made. Um, not as complicated as you might think. And I think anyone, even a beginner could do this and someone with more experience could, could do whatever you like. It, it's, you know, it's, it's your ideas that are important here and not my ideas. I'm here to sort of spark your ideas and, and help you get going, particularly when you might be at home without a lot of materials and not access to get them just at the moment. So you can see this can be made with quite minimal amounts of fabric. I think for the yellows, I actually did use hand dyed fabrics, but batiks, anything like that, it, it doesn't matter. You could use um, fabric paints on them to create this extra shading. So don't, don't feel restricted if you don't have a lot of materials at home at the moment. And finally, on to the Japanese wind flowers. Now, again, this one is made using the same technique that I teach in the applique art quilts book that I have on Amazon. In fact, this book is on, this quilt is on the cover. Um, so you'll find that book if you're interested in learning how I do this sort of freestyle stained glass technique, but without using bias tape. 
So it's more arty, I guess, than, than bias tape, or just different. Now, what I did here, again, I've, I've actually used fabric paints to create some of this shading, but I did use, again, hand-dyed fabrics to make this one. So it had some of its own natural shading already. These little seed pods, I've actually done a sort of cross hatching. I've done it just stitched straight across, well, not straight across, I've sort of curved it a bit to make them look like balls, done that, and then the other direction. So it really was just straight stitch cross hatching. In the middle here, now you have to be careful, I did build this up a lot and there were occasions when I found that there was so much stitching there that the needle was punching through and getting a bit stuck. You know then that you've pretty much reached the limit of how much stitching you can put on. But again, I used a variety of colours of shades of yellow here from quite a, a white yellow to a much brighter one in order to gradually stitch outwards to build up these layers of colour. And yes, I've, I've actually got some green in there too. I don't know if you can see that. Um, I think you probably can. There's a little bit here and it's just poking through. And it all adds... I think a really nice depth and, and that feeling of texture that we're after here. So again, this is, it looks complicated, but it's not, it's just a whole lot of straight stitching in and out and in and out, mixing the colors. So I might've done a little bit of the darker color first because I didn't want that too prominent. And then I probably added the green and then the lighter yellow. I do like using the light colours on the back sometimes. And then building up that gold or colour for the stamens because I've then gone over the actual stamens here. You might be able to see it better on the little seed pods here where I've actually, they, they're the last thing I did because they then need to go over the edge and onto the background to show the little um, bit of pollen that sits on the end of the stamens. So I want you to experiment with adding texture either in an abstract form or to something like this flowers are a perfect way to practice this sort of thing but you could do it with anything you would do with an apple or a pear or a vase whatever you like um, it's it's really nice to add this texture and this for once for me was not zigzag stitch it was free motion straight stitch so i hope with these different examples today i've given you some ideas for different things you can do and next week I will be back with something else and that will be your next surprise so in the meantime I want you to take care stay well and keep smiling and keep stitching because I'll be back and you can't miss that bye <laughs>